Before colonization took a hold across the North American territories in the 15th century AD, various tribal civilizations existed across the beautiful continental landscape, from the swamps in the south, to the woodland hills in the east, to the plains in the midwest, to the mountains in the central, and the deserts in the west. Indigenous folk of a pre-Columbus America dominated the countryside without even a thought of white settlers beckoning to explore their land in the centuries to come. These tribes weren't simply barbaric masses of savages and killers, but rather complex societies featuring thousands of languages and dialects, cultures with passionate obligations, political systems and leadership councils, and religions saturated with spiritualism and mythology. Unfortunately, however, a majority of these customs and beliefs were nearly wiped completely from the history books after the introduction of colonization in America in the 16th century, which saw the number of Native American populations decrease by hundreds of thousands. Only microscopic portions of these tribes make up American demographics in the present day. In order to preserve their histories, cultures, and ways of life, this is the second in a series of brief essays documenting the rich details of Native American tribes, ranging from the First Nations in Canada to the Nativos Mexicanos in Mexico. This is the story of the Numina, translated to the people in English, and colloquially known as the Comanche. One of the most fascinating aspects of the Comanche culture is their language, a unique variation of older languages and dialects seen amongst indigenous tribes. The language is named after the tribe itself, called Comanche, and represents a numic language that stems from the larger tree of udo aztecan languages. Years ago, the Comanche broke off from a larger sect of Native American peoples, called the Shoshone, Occurring around the year 1700, the Comanche then held on to the language of the Shoshone even into the late 1780s, where the first records of interactions with the Comanche suggest they used dialects of Shoshone. It wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century historians began to document the changes recognized in the official Comanche language. These differences were slight but impactful, with the low-level sound changes completely separating the new dialect from the old. The changes made it nearly impossible for a speaker of one dialect to show mutual understanding of both, and the newer Comanche dialect slowly faded out of use. One reason for this was the boarding schools forced on Comanche children in the late 19th century, at the conclusion of the American Indian Wars. Students at the schools were instructed to only learn and utilize English, rather than their native dialects. Children who did not obey these directions were punished. Around the same time, notable Comanche chief Quanah Parker learned English himself, and told his own children to avoid using their native language as they would prosper in America if they stuck to speaking English. The Comanche language continued to dissipate, but not before contributing a vital piece of warfare during World War II. The U.S. Army, after seeing much success with their code-talking program during World War I, implemented a similar strategy the second time around. Specifically, for the U.S. invasion of Normandy on June 6, 1944, a group of 17 Comanche soldiers, called the Comanche Code Talkers, were utilized on D-Day to transmit vital information that could not be deciphered by Axis powers. All 17 men survived, and their hold on the Comanche language played an important role on one of the most important days in world history. Despite their heroism, however, the language continued to dwindle back in the United States. As of present day, less than 1% of Comanche elders can speak their official language. Luckily, despite the disheartening disappearance of the Comanche language, the rest of their culture lives on, dating all the way back to their days as hunter-gatherers of the Rocky Mountain region. Food always played an intimate role in the Comanche's culture, as its resourcing came from both men and women. All able-bodied members of a Comanche tribe were tasked with providing food, regardless of gender. These practices continued until the introduction of horses by the European explorers, and the Comanche quickly evolved primarily into a hunting tribe, 
a profession in which men mostly dominated. Large hunts would target game such as bison, elk, bear, and deer. The Comanche rarely ate fish, and would only resort to smaller game and fowl if the tribe was especially hungry, or big game hunting was less than sufficient. When white settlers began homesteading in and around Comanche lands, hunters would then target the cattle as an additional source of food. While the men hunted, women were not without tasks related to food preparation. Comanche women would still gather berries and various fruits available to them. This included prickly pear cactus, wild onions, plums, pecans, and persimmons. When cooking meat, the women would carve holes into the ground, line them with buffalo stomach and other skins, and use the pit as a large cooking basin. Then, stones heated over a fire would be dropped into the pit until the water inside started boiling. Eventually, Spanish explorers in the region introduced copper and iron cookware to the Comanche, who favored these tools as they made the cooking process easier and faster. The specific diet of the Comanche ranged from bison marrow mush, crushed beans, raw liver, deer milk, and pemmican for the warrior bands. These dishes were served at all times of the day, especially with the appearance of friendly visitors. However, most Comanche ate smaller breakfasts and larger dinners, and only ate in the midday hours if it was convenient. In terms of appearance, the Comanche men often wore their hair long, sometimes parted straight down the middle and greased backwards. Their hair could often be seen braided with a pair of long braids held by cloth, with a single strand braided with beads in a feather, called a scalp lock. Women, on the other hand, did not wear their hair as long as men, but did share the use of braids and scalp paint. Warriors of the Comanche did not wear their headdresses often associated with plains tribes, but rather could be seen wearing a buffalo scalp headpiece featuring the bison's head and horns adorned on top. Comanche culture is also heavily based in body decoration. Ear piecings made of wire and shells were popular, as were geometric tattoos featured heavily on the bodies of Comanche men. The Comanche also utilized body and face paint. While black was reserved for wartime, other colors were available at any point in time. There were no set rules on what could or could not be painted on an individual. Rather, it was up to the emotions and styles of each person who would base their paintings on their personality. Women would often be seen using red and yellow pigment to paint around their lips, as well as red, orange, and yellow paint on their ears and cheeks. These colors came from berry juices and clay, and later from vermilion and grease supplied by European traders. The clothing of the Comanche included buffalo and deerskin moccasins, robes made out of big game hides, buckskin between the legs, and leggings made of loose deerskin. Men would often go naked from the waist up, as did young boys prior to adulthood. After the 19th century, woven cloth usurped the buckskin, and men started wearing shirts. Women chose dresses and long-sleeved blouses made of deerskin, but decorated their larger garments with animal fur, beads, and other bits of scrap. In the winter months, Comanche would reinforce their clothing with buffalo hide, replacing moccasins with boots lined with fur, and heavier coats made up of whatever the thickest hides the tribe had acquired during the hunting seasons. When it came to arts and crafts, the Comanche relied completely on the American buffalo as a resource for their materials. Everything from clothing, tools, weapons, cookware, and shelter was made from the hides, bones, tendons, and the horns of bison. Later, after the decimation of the American buffalo, the Comanche traded for these goods with settlers, as basket weaving, wood carving, and the construction of metal-based goods was never implemented in their culture. In terms of the life of a Comanche, each tribe had specific customs when it came to birth, lasting all the way till death. For birthing practices, women would often go into labor at camp, usually located in their teepee or a lodging. After the baby was born, the umbilical cord was then hung undisturbed on a nearby tree. If it remained there untouched before it spoiled, this was considered a sign that the baby in question would live a healthy, fortunate life. When it came to naming a baby boy, the fathers would often turn to medicine men of the tribe to conduct an official naming ceremony. 
This involved the smoking of a pipe in all four directions, and a series of prayers while the child was then held towards the sky by the medicine man. For baby girls, names were picked out by the mother and often resembled the names of the father's side of the family. Most children acquired nicknames as they reached adolescence, but this wasn't a guarantee. Gender roles usually saw boys following men around, learning from their day-to-day -day lives, and girls learning from the women. Punishment was usually reserved only in rare circumstances, and would involve the stories of boogeymen who visit children in the night. By 12 years old, girls acted like women and truly took upon all of their responsibilities. After an initiation into adulthood, the female tribesmen would then be considered for marriage. Boys had until they were 15 before their rite of passage into adulthood. These usually consisted of vision quests in which young men tapped into their spirituality and learned the ropes of medicine. Afterwards, they'd be fully trained in the arts of a warrior, and if they passed their final tests, they'd be made through a tradition known as the giveaway dance. These saw the young man in question dance while the rest of the tribe threw gifts at his feet, sometimes until the fellow tribesmen had nothing. The Comanche prided themselves as warriors, especially after the horse trade made its mark on the entire tribe. Before horses, the Comanche traveled using travois, pulled by dogs, but quickly favored horses after trading with the Spaniards, Pueblo tribes, and later with American settlers. As was previously mentioned, the horse trade revolutionized the Comanche way of life, transforming the way they both prepared their food and the way they fought. The number of horses a man owned became the number one method in determining his wealth and gave the Comanche a huge advantage amongst other warrior bands of indigenous Americans. This is the point where the Comanche received their label as the most feared Native American tribe. With horses, the Comanche were able to conduct countless raids across the land, most notably on European settlers, migrating parties, and those traveling west along the Southwest Trails. Up until the Christian missionaries convinced the Comanche to treat their dead as is normal in modern day funeral practices, they actually had a very specific custom when it came to mourning the dead. When a Comanche tribal member died, the corpse was placed in a blanket or big game hide and set atop a horse behind the rider. The one selected to ride the horse would then traverse the open land until they found a location befit for a proper burial. Once the place was found, the body of the dead would be covered by stones, and the rider would return to their camp where the possessions of the dead were burned. Afterwards, the most prominent mourner would cut their arms and spill blood as a symbol of their grief. It was one of the many beautiful artifacts of a Comanche culture struggling to remain in today's world. As previously mentioned, the Comanche's history closely resembles that of the Eastern Shoshone, located mostly in present-day Wyoming. It's estimated the Comanche tribe broke away from the Shoshone around the 16th century and migrated south to present-day Colorado, where they were first encountered as a traveling plains tribe. The reasoning for their move is usually associated with a less arid climate where bison were more frequently found in the Great Plains. In the late 17th century, the Comanche is thought to have formed an alliance with the Ute tribes, as they shared the San Luis Valley and the Sangre de Cristo Mountains when hunting bison during the summer months. It was around the same time, approximately 1680, that the Comanche are thought to have made their first horse trades with the Pueblo tribes, after they had pushed out the Spanish from present-day New Mexico in the Pueblo Revolt. The European nations at large then first heard of the Comanche's aggressive style of nomad life on the plains, when a Spanish soldier warned the leaders in the newly established settlement of Taos, New Mexico. By the end of the 18th century, there were two major sections of Comanche peoples, one being the western bands of Colorado, New Mexico, and the Texas Panhandle, and the other being the eastern bands of Oklahoma and Central Texas. The former bands were in direct conflict with Spanish settlements of New Mexico, while the latter bands were in conflict with the Texas Spaniards. Eventually, a third major conflict broke out with the French located in the eastern Great Plains regions. These conflicts 
are what carried the Comanche's wartime efforts into the first half of the 19th century, and ended up springing five separate divisions of Comanche altogether. The aforementioned conflicts came in the form of the Comanche Wars, with major subcategories of battles called the Comanche-Mexican War and the Texas-Indian Wars. The Comanche-Mexican War lasted nearly 50 years from 1821 to 1870, and was fought by the Comanche alongside friendly bands of Kiowa and Apache warriors. These conflicts were for the most part raids on the weakened Mexican infrastructure in America, as well as the defense of Comancheria from settlers and rival indigenous tribes. The Texas Indian Wars lasted from around the same time frame, between 1820 and 1875. These conflicts centered more on the ill will felt between the Comanche and other Plains tribes, and the Mexicans, Spaniards, Texans, and Americans. The Texas Indian Wars are what truly gave credence to the claim of the Comanche's legacy as fierce and feared Lords of the Plains. They attacked with unrelenting precision and rarely had time for peace. As the fight for land rights became a losing battle, they instead turned to raids, kidnappings, and even more violent battles with the settlers, lawmen, and United States military. Unfortunately for the Comanche, they were unable to keep up with the increasing manpower and resources of the state of Texas and U.S. Army at large. The sweeping cholera outbreaks of the 1840s were the first ticking time bomb on the Comanche, as they and every other native tribe suffered mass casualties from illness and disease. They were then slowly yet strategically eliminated from western territories, first through the erasure of bison in the entire Great Plains region. By 1879, almost no American buffalo remained in Comanche territory, depleting the warriors of their main source of food, tools, shelter, clothing, and way of life. Then came the two battles of adobe walls, the first in 1864 and the second in 1874. The latter saw the failed attempt of the Comanche to attack a hunting group of Texas Panhandle settlers. As a result, the U.S. Army led one final push to force all remaining free Comanche tribesmen to reservations. By 1875, there were only one remaining band of free Comanche warriors. They were led by Chief Quanah Parker, who ultimately surrendered to the United States and moved his band to the Fort Sill Reservation in present-day Oklahoma. Over the next 25 years, Parker attempted to make life better for his people, now crowded on lackluster land, meeting with officials in Washington, D.C. on countless occasions. He fought for religious freedom for the Native American church, and to bring opportunity to Oklahoma reservations. Quanta Parker died in February of 1911, ending a long-standing era of Comanche leadership in the Great Plains. As the leadership systems changed, and nearly all Comanche citizens were assimilated into American life, attitudes on the reservation changed for many. By World War II, nearly half of the Comanche located in Oklahoma departed tribal lands for California and the surrounding states. These Comanche were desperate for better opportunities and a fresh start, with some seeking to return to the lands of their ancestors. As of today, nearly half of the remaining 17,000 Comanche population live in the town of Lawton, Oklahoma. The rest are mostly dispersed throughout the southwestern United States, doing everything they can to retain what's left of their culture, language, and history. It's easy to think of the Comanche and only attribute them to the violence across the American frontier during the Wild West heyday and into the mid to late 19th century, but it's important to remember their livelihoods date back centuries before. Instead, Think of the Comanche as defenders of the Great Plains, bonded to each other and to the natural world around them through a dedicated focus on courage. Think of them as expert buffalo hunters and agile warriors. Think of them as dreamers and spiritualists with a deep-rooted focus on bravery, brotherhood, and passion. This is the story of the Namana. This is the story of the Comanche.